this experience begins, we just want to pause and say thank you for watching this whenever, wherever. And our hope is not that you're just passively consuming this content, but that you are using it in your discipleship journey, that you're sharing this hope with other people. And we want to hear stories of how God is using this in your life. And so you can drop a comment below or email me anytime online at cccomaha.org and we will help you take your best next step. Grandma used to pray out loud by her bed every night. To me it sounded like mumbling, but she was out of her mind. She said, boy, this kind of praying is what saved my life. You ought to try it some. She was right, she was talking to Jesus. She was talking to Jesus. She'd been talking to Jesus for all of her life. Mama used to drag me to church Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Khaki pants and a polo shirt Boy, I put up a fight She said, son, one day you'll thank me For having God in your life Yeah, I know she was right Yeah, my mama was right Now I'm talking to Jesus Got me talking to Jesus she got me talking to Jesus, yeah, my mama was right, cause I'm talking to Jesus, yeah, I love talking to Jesus, and I'll be talking to Jesus for the rest of my life, what a friend we have in what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Whoa. I got three of my own now. I'm trying to raise them up right. My oldest is 14. And I remember what that was like. Trying to deal with the drama Trying to figure out the questions in life And I've been looking for a way to show her How to make it all right And she walked in my room I was saying my prayers the other night She said, I'll come back later I can tell you've got a lot on Said it's not an interruption. You couldn't have picked a better time. Cause I was just talking to Jesus. Come over and give it a try. We started talking to Jesus. We started talking to Jesus. We started talking to Jesus.
Happy Mother's Day. Well, there's a whole swirl of emotions that we come to when we come to a Mother's Day. Some of you are sitting next to your mom right now. And showing up in church is like the biggest gift that you could give to your mom. And if that's the case for you, whether it's here or online, I want to say, way to go. Great job. Some of you are a far distance from your mom. That's like me. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. She's in Champaign, Illinois. And you feel that distance on a day like Mother's Day. And I just want to remind you, call your mother later today. Don't miss that appointment to check in with her and wish her a happy Mother's Day. Some of you may be feeling even more of a distance. You know, maybe you have a mom who's passed away recently. Or maybe you have a, you're a mom and you have a kid who's passed away recently and your heart is troubled and there's very real grieving that happens on Mother's Day. I want you to know this is the very best place that you can be because it's in Jesus that we have hope for eternal life that we can celebrate mothers who are here and mothers who are gone, and that we can look forward to the reunion that we will one day have in Jesus with all who have gone before us. This is good news, amen? So we grieve and we celebrate and we remember, but one of the things that's true about everybody is everybody either has or at one time in their life has had a mom. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here at this point. So I have a little ode to moms I'd like to read to you, and I have to give appropriate credit where credit is due, and that everything good that I learned about being a mom, I learned from watching my wife, Kelly, my favorite mom. So this is an ode to moms. Here we go. After the morning sickness, you were tired out, wrung out, and stretched out. You pushed that slimy, wormy, smashed head beauty into the world with great pain and greater joy. And for endless nights, you rocked and sang and nursed and nurtured. You were a diaper slinger, a tantrum tolerator, and a colored teacher and a mac and cheese maker. You were the professor of ABCs, colors, history, Bible, character, life, and love. You became the chauffeur, logging countless minivan miles to art class, tennis lessons, church, and stores. You spent more time than we thought possible, sitting on a hard bench, cheering your lungs out, than congratulating or consoling. You sacrificed your savings on college expenses, assuring that they got a degree to set them up for life. And when they moved out of state for that dream, that spouse, you still called, still cared, sent stuff, made stuff, and even took it there. Later, when your babies had babies, you took all your wisdom and you shared it freely so that they could be better parents even than you were. How can we cram all of this into one small statement, one small word, one small bit of thanks for you. It's with these three little letters, M-O-M. We're grateful for you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. I'd love to go ahead and pray now and give thanks for all of our moms. Will you join me in prayer? Father, thanks for blessing us with the amazing gifts of moms. They are a treasure in our lives. They are a joy for us. They've invested on us more than we could imagine and more than we'd ever know. They are grace to us, your undeserved favor. So thank you, God, for giving us moms. Thank you for the life and love that you give us in Jesus and for the grace that you show through him. And we pray, God, as we celebrate our moms and we celebrate Jesus this day, that you would be pleased, that your heart would be happy, and you would receive our worship well. Because we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. Amen, let's worship together, let's stand to our feet. God is good. We thank you, God. Who's great? 
Amen. He's also our only source of hope, and he is alive. Would you continue worshiping with us this morning? How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. Turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written.
Jesus, through it all, through every moment, our prayer would be that our eyes are fixed on your face. That our eyes would be fixed on your character, on who you are, that we would follow you. Through it all, the valleys, the mountains, the ones who are grieving today, the ones who are in sorrow, the ones who have joy, the ones who have gladness. Through it all, we can say with confidence that it is well, even when it doesn't feel well. It is well because your presence is with us. It is well because you are seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. It is well because you are a living hope and one day all will be made well. And we can say that it is well today. Our eyes can be fixed on your face because the work has been done. It is well, it is finished. It is well within our souls. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Christ Community Church Online and happy Mother's Day to any of the moms out there. It's such a joy for me and for our church at Christ Community to be in your living room or in your camper or on your phone every single week. And it means so much to us that you're taking a part of your day to gather in community, to, to sing songs of praise to Jesus, to open up God's word and to uh, be fed spiritually. And one of our hopes is not that you're just passively consuming this content. Uh, we don't put this out there so that you just uh, have something to do for the next hour, but our hope is that Jesus is using it to transform your life. Not that you're just an IP address somewhere in the internet world. And, and we want to get to know you. We want to know your story. We want to know how God is using uh, this ministry in your life to encourage us to continue to press on and use it. And so would you send me an email online at cccomaha.org uh, today? Maybe right now you pause this and you send it or you send it after the service and let us know just something specific of how God is using this. If you got a prayer request, you can send it that way, but we want to connect with you and help you take your best next step. A couple quick things I wanna let you know about and invite you to consider. The first is giving. Every single week, this happens because people are faithfully given to the mission that God has called us to. So uh, would you pray about how you partner with us as we partner with God to take this message to your living room, to, to people all across the globe so people can know and experience Jesus. The second thing I want you to consider is being baptized. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you've said yes to following him and making him the Lord of your life and you have not been baptized, I wanna invite you to, to pray about making that decision. We've got a special service happening on our campus on June the 5th, where we are going to be baptizing dozens of people who have made commitments to follow Jesus. Maybe you live somewhere far away and you're like, I can't get there on June 5th and that's okay. I want to hear from you. You can send me an email online at cccomaha.org or you can sign up through uh, cccomaha.info uh, for baptism and we can walk you through the process of being baptized wherever you are locally and then we can share that with our congregation uh, coming up soon so i want to encourage you again if you haven't been baptized to pray about that we will figure out a way to tell your story to help you go public with your faith and be baptized so would you consider that today Hey, speaking of cccomaha.info and Baptism on the Green, one fun way you can be involved no matter what is going today to cccomaha.info and you can vote on the shirt that we're going to let participants wear this year at Baptism on the Green and throughout the year when they're being baptized. It's a fun way for, for people to wear that as they're being dunked and declaring this new life in Jesus and they get to take it with them and wear it in the highways and byways of life to remember that moment. And we want you to be a part of deciding what the shirt is, what the design is, and then on June 5th at Baptism on the Green, 
you will get to see what we picked for that shirt. Go vote right now. The epic narrative of the first 11 chapters of the Bible lays the foundation for understanding God's redemptive story for the world and for us. In Genesis chapter 10, we read about the nations of the ancient world, all descending from three brothers, but choosing very different paths and foreshadowing much of what's to come. Good morning to everyone who's joining us online across the city and across the world. So grateful for you who are here uh, in person as well as on the internet. And uh, friends, today is our 11th part in a 12-part series going through Genesis chapter 1 through 11. It's all about the table of nations. And right up front, I have to confess, this is the most boring passage that there is in all of Genesis. In fact, it may be the most boring text that I've ever preached from in my entire life. It's just name, 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 and aren't you looking forward to the message here this morning now? (laughs) Yeah, we got one. I love it. I love it. Now, some people think of this as flyover country in the Bible. Like, you get to the names, you're like, name, Shem, Ham, Japheth, blah, blah, blah. Let's get to Genesis chapter 11 where the action starts. But it's not just flyover country. Let let me remind you that some people think of Nebraska as flyover country. And we who live here know that this is a beautiful place full of amazing jewels when you are here in the midst of it. Well, Genesis 10 is exactly the same, that when you dig in a little bit deeper, you'll find all kinds of amazing jewels that are in there. And Allison and I are going to do our best to be able to be teaching this. By the way, this is Minister Allison. She leads our young adult ministries. Can you guys give it up for Allison? Oh, there is a fan club up there, Allison. Look look out for that. Well, you know, Genesis answers the question, where did all these people come from? Genesis chapter 10 in particular. And with 7.6 billion people in this world, 196 countries and over 6,500 languages, there is a question, how did we get from Noah and his tiny little family to all of this diversity and all these people? Genesis 10 begins the explanation of that. It does. In its essence, Genesis 10 is just an old family tree. We've got three sons, sons become dads, dads become families, and families become clans. Clans become nations. And it was the fulfillment of the multiply and fill the earth. You remember back to Adam and Eve and their command to uh, make babies and fill the earth, right? That was what they were commissioned to. And then in Noah, uh, in chapter nine, was revisited not once, but twice. And he, you know, it's basically like, okay, Noah, here's your job. Fill the earth and subdue it. Spread out, multiply. And that Genesis 10 is that account of what was happening. It was accomplished. So chapter 10 becomes that linking chapter. It links the multiply and become a nation with God's plan to reach all the nations through Abraham which starts in chapter 12. In fact, the whole theme of this chapter is God is working the plan. Let's say it, let's say it together. God is working the plan. God has a sovereign plan and he is working it through. God's sovereignty is amazing in this chapter as you look how he orders everything. And this chapter is known as an ethnography. Now, interestingly, it's not just a genealogy because it talks about not just who was the sons of who, but what tribes did they become, what nations did they become, what languages did they evolve into, and where did they spread around the earth? And one of the coolest things about Genesis chapter 10 is there is no equivalent to it in ancient literature. There's nothing in the Sumerian accounts, Akkadian accounts, Babylonian accounts, Egyptian accounts. Nobody tries to do what Moses does in Genesis chapter 10, which is cool just because of the uniqueness of it. But it's also noteworthy because if you want to do some fact checking and see, hey, what did the other people say? We actually have no other documents to be able to fill in more information on this. 
I mean, there are names of people, place names, city names, those kinds of things you can double check. And archaeologically, all of those things check out, but there are no other ancient documents that are anything like this one. Now, if we were to make this ethnography into an org chart, the org chart would look something like this. Now, I want to point out here that when you read in the Bible about generations, oftentimes they will report a generation as a son of, but they're skipping generations. So son of oftentimes means descendant of, or father of could mean ancestor of, and there might be many generations in between. Now, we've developed this org chart as if every generation is directly linked, and there are six generations that you can knock out here. But as we do this, it's a little bit deceiving because this may, there may be many generations in between any one of these lines. It's also worthy to note that in Genesis chapter 10, as it goes through all of these 70 names, some of the names aren't actually names of people, but they're names of clans. If you look over in this section up here, you'll see that you have a whole bunch of words that end in ites. And anytime you see something that ends in ites, it's not a person, it's a people group. So the Ludites, Anamites, Leobites, Naphtalites, uh, and all of these different names that are on here are names of people groups. So what Moses is doing is he's working both top down and bottom up. What do I mean by that? Well, top down, you can see at the top, there's Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Those are like normal names that are there, uh, real names of real people. But then bottom up, Moses, who comes hundreds, maybe thousands of years after Noah, is looking around at all the tribes and nations. He's saying, what exists out there that we know of? And he's linking what we know of in the world with what we know comes from history. And he's creating how do all of them fit, fit together. So we have the links of people groups, but we also have links of nations that are out there. Entire nations are named. So Cush, which is Ethiopia. Egypt, which is? Egypt. Egypt, yeah. Put, which is Libya. Seba, which I can't remember. And uh, Havilah, which is Saudi Arabia, are actually nations that were there during the time of Moses that were, had their origins in these people. So you see, the ethnography is designed to say, how does Noah and his kids connect with all of the people that are coming underneath? Now, one of the things we know about this, this ethnography in particular is it's not designed to include every name of every person. For example, none of the girls are in there. You know, we don't see any girl names in there. Obviously, there were girls that were around during the time. We also see interesting things like the fifth generation only has two names to it. But the sixth generation has 13 names to it. In a normal kind of diagram, it would be an increasing pyramid that gets bigger and bigger. That's not the way that it is. One of the names that you see in there is the name Peleg. And Peleg has no children in this chapter, in chapter 10. But in chapter 11, we'll find out that Peleg has an extensive genealogy that winds up leading down to Abraham, who becomes our next main character. So we know that the author, Moses, is not trying to say, hey, let me give you every name of every person that's out there, but he's selectively demonstrating in a powerful, symbolic way 70 people who he wanted to identify. And that number 70 is significant. Can you help us with that? It is. Numbers throughout scripture, when I look at them, I see two different things. It could be a mathematical uh, exactness, or it could be a literary device. And so when I'm looking at scripture and I see numbers, I'm looking, okay, what is, what's going on? And as Mark already said, there were no women in here. And so we, we have this thing going, ah, it doesn't seem like it's exact, but we do see there are exactly 70 names, 14 from Japheth, 30 from Ham, and 26 from Shem. All of that adds up to 70. So with the individuals, groups, and the lack of females, we kind of get this deduction that this is probably not mathematically exact. The author is trying to tell us something. And what the author is doing is using that literary device to tell us, look at 70. What does 70 mean? And 70, what I'm gonna show you in just a moment, I'm gonna explain it more, is that it's complete. And so the author, they did what was, ex what they're trying to say is, they wanted to show you that they're doing exactly what was asked of them. They're making a complete genealogy in the fact that they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They multiplied and they filled the earth. 
that God wanted complete, and they did it. So let's break down that 70. You can see up here, we've got 70. We've got seven, 10 times, and we've got 10, seven times. And either way you look at that, it makes a complete rectangle. We make a complete uh, graph right here. Um, and those two numbers, seven and 10, are really important, not just to Israel, but to all of the ancient world. They all would have taken these numbers and run with them as complete. When 10, I think, is an easy one, we look at our hands and we've got 10 fingers and we look at our toes, we've got 10 toes. When you have a baby, you count really quick. Do they have all, all five on each hand? Do we have 10 fingers? Do we have 10 toes? But seven, seven, why, why seven? Well, if you look to the sky, the lunar cycle, you look at the moon and they all would have been able to do this. They all would have followed that. And you have seven cycles to half, seven to sil to sliver, <laughs> not silver, seven to sliver, seven to half, and then seven to full. And everyone could see and adopted that seven day system. So seven represented complete, 10 represented complete. So this literary device is a multiplying of seven of the lunar cycle and 10 of the, the fingers. So we've got complete multiplied by complete, which gets super complete or 70. Uh, and it's a very important symbol that we see all throughout scripture, like all the way through. So here's a couple other ones that you may remember. 70 members of Jacob's family that entered Egypt during the time of famine. 70 years in exile in Babylon, which we'll see in just a moment, was established by Nimrod, one of Ham's descendants. 70 sevens in Daniel's prophecies. And in the Sanhedrin, there's actually 70 priests. Now, we could go crazy with numbers, but that's really not the point. The point is that God is using this literary device to say, I'm working the plan. So God is working his plan. Today, that author just wanted to show us, here's a, su a super complete list that, to let you know that the boys from the boat they did what they were supposed to do. They multiplied and they filled the earth. So let's go meet them. All right, we're gonna go ahead and read the entire genealogy from Genesis chapter 10. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and pull them out if you'd like to follow along. If you don't, there's one in the seat in front of you. And as always, you can take that along as a gift from us if you're somebody who does not have a Bible uh, in a language that you can understand. So you can pull it up on your phones, watch on the screens and so forth. And before we jump in, I just have to confess that Allison and I have no idea how to say all these names. We're just kind of plowing through them and guessing. In fact, these names are like 3,000 years old, and to be quite honest, nobody knows how their mama said their name. <laughs> we just don't know these things. So anytime you're reading through ancient names in the Bible, just plow through, make your best guess, and nobody can tell you that you were wrong because they don't know either. So we're going to go ahead and put a map up at this point and uh, take a look at all of the genealogy as it kind of flows through the map. Here's where it starts. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth. Now, just pause right here. The sons of Japheth would be known as the Japhethites. And note that the sons of Japheth moved north and west, that they filled Turkey and eventually they filled Europe. So if you are a person who is of Turkish or European descent, you have Japheth to blame or give credit to or thank. All right, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Haven, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras, the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. So just as a side note, if you're a young couple and you're pregnant, and you're ever looking for unique biblical names for your children, look no further than Genesis chapter 10. <laughs> you too could send a little Ashkenaz, Riphath, or Togarma <laughs> to kindergarten. And you would guarantee that nobody else would have the same name as your kid in the whole class. All right, the sons of Haven, 
Elisha, Tarshish, the Kittites, and the Rodanites. From these, the maritime people spread out into their territories by their clans within their nations, each with its own language. And then we have the sons of Ham, the Hamites, probably where we get all the sandwich shops from. <laughs> these guys move from the southwest toward Africa, but they also go east toward India, and they also settle in between, especially that line of Nimrod. Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Sabtika, the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dadan. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kelna in the Shinar. From that land, we went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Kala, which is the great city. Now, I wanna show you where these are on the map. You've got, you can see that they're all happening right in between the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. And I'm just not tall enough to really get in there, so you'll just have to look. But if you follow those down, you can see we've got Nineveh and Rehoboth at the top, the Tower of Babel, Babylon, and Uruk at the bottom. And so he really went right in between both of those rivers. All right, so after we have our little Nimrod excursus, we get back to Egypt. Egypt was the father of the Ludites, Anamites, Lehabites, Naphilites, Perothrosites, Calchalites, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtarites. Notice, once again, these are tribes and not individuals. Ites tips you off to that. And the descendants of Canaan were in a similar boat. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and of the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvidites, Zemorites, and Hamathites, not to mention the stalactites and stalagmites. <laughs> Later, the Canaanite clan scattered, and the borders of Canaan reached from Sidon towards Gerar, as far as Gaza, and then towards Sodom, Gomorrah, Adama, Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans and languages in their territories and nations. And then there were the sons of Shem, the Semites. Note, these descendants of Shem are known as those Semites. And if you were against these people, then you would have that name, anti-Semitic. And this is where we get the, that, that's where that term comes from. And these folks settle around Israel and to the east. They're the tightest circle right there around the promised land. Shem, whose older brother was Japheth, Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. Uh, the sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram, the sons of Aram, Uz. So in the book of Job, Uz is the place where Job came from. But in history, nobody knows where Uz was. It's totally a dad joke. Mark totally wrote it. <laughs> I just got to say it. <laughs> Hull, Gether, Meshech, our fact said was the father of Shela, and Shela the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg, because in his time, the earth was divided. So we actually believe that he was born right around that time of Babylon when the languages were divided, thus his name. And he had a brother named Joktan. Now before we go into Joktan's kids, I just have to say a word of apology <laughs> to our sign language community here <laughs> for all of these names that they have to spell out letter by letter. <laughs> there we go, all right. <laughs> thank you, thank you, yeah. I still have like 20 more, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Joktan was the father of Almodad, Sheleph, Hezer Marveth, Jera, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. Try and keep up with that. <laughs> Some scholars think that Jobab might be the long name for our historical character, Job. All of these were sons of Joktan. 
The region where they lived stretched from Mesha towards Shephar in the eastern hill country. These are the sons of Shem and their clans and languages in their territories and their nations. And these are the clans of Noah's sons, according to their lines of descent within their nations. And from these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. Phew! We're done with Genesis chapter 10. And thank you, thank you. This is where all of the nations come from, and the idea behind it is that God is working the plan. He's moving from multiply and fill the earth to we have multiplied and filled the earth. And I probably could only remember a few of those names, but God remembers them all. He, rem he knows each of their names. He knows each of their stories. He knows each one as a person. And he has a relationship with each one. He cares for them, he coaches them, and even redirects them. And God cares for each of them. And even as we skim over these names, he never skims. And I want you to take that thought for you. In this room and online, we probably have about 1,500 people watching. You, I probably know a couple dozen, but God knows each and every one. He knows each and every one of our names. He knows each one of our stories. He knows our insecurities. He knows the things, our triumphs from the week. And he also knows the things that we're grieving. He knows how you feel about today, Mother's Day. And he knows what jokes make you laugh. And he also knows what movie makes you cry, even when you try not to. And he also knows the thing that you hope nobody, ever else, and nobody else ever finds out about. He knows your name, first, middle, and last. He knows the hairs on your head and on your fingers. He cares about you. He's waiting for you to sit with him where he can say, Jamie, I love you. Natalie, I'm so glad you're my kid. James, I think about you a lot. Not only does God know us name by name and person by person, but he also wants to point out in this uh, ethnography that we are all one shared humanity, that we're all one people, we're all descendants of the same person. So he knew that there would become division that nation would rise up against nation, clan would raise up against clan, that there would be racism in our world and people would divide over race. Have you guys ever seen that happening in our culture? That this pain would be out there, but Genesis 10 serves as a reminder that we're all one family. That if you're ever in conflict with somebody over racial issues or war issues, if you ever wind up fighting somebody else in this world, you're actually fighting family and that we are one race, the human race, going back to Noah and his family, going back to Adam and Eve. And we find out that God knew where everybody was going to be distributed all over the map, that there would be a Shem zone and there would be a Ham zone and there would be a Japheth zone and people would become increasingly diverse because God loves diversity. And then you'll notice that all three of these zones, the Shem zone, the Ham zone, the Japheth zone, if we could throw this uh, map back up again, all three of these zones all intersect right here in this area. And you guys know what this area is right here, right? This is Israel. This is Israel. This is the promised land. This is where Moses was headed with all of the people as he's writing this literature it's where the people of Israel would live. And sometimes people ask, how come there's been so much war and so much conflict that's taken place in Israel? Well, part of the answer is because everybody considers it to be their home. Everyone considers it a part of their turf. The other reason that I've told you a number of times in the past is that this area here, Saudi Arabia, is all a big fat desert. So if you want to move from Asia to Africa, the only realistic way to go is through Israel. 
If you want to move from Africa up to Europe, the only realistic way to go is through Israel. So it was a key route for trade. It was a key route for the military. And if you wanted to ever dominate somebody in another continent, you had to go through Israel. This is why Israel's history is so pockmarked with captivity and takeovers and wars and pain. It's because everybody thinks it's their space and because it's a strategic location to get to other continents. We know that God put his people right in the middle of the plan for history because one day Jesus was going to land in that territory and one day he would want Jesus to go to all three continents. What better place for him to start than to start at the intersection that is Israel? God was working the plan. He was working his plan. And I love that even in his plan, he allows for the messy. Messy people like Nimrod, who is the only person that we get much information about, and we don't really get why. Why just him, other than to see that as it keeps going, he's notable for the fact that he was the first empire builder. And because I believe he's really truly evil, and I'm gonna explain to you why I think that is. First of all, let's just start right here. You can see he is from the line of Ham, and he comes all the way, and then his father is Cush, and if you follow that line all the way over to Nimrod, there's a bunch of descendants under him, but he is the son of Cush and grandfather Ham. So the five reasons why I think that he is evil, because the text is not super clear unless you start digging deeper into it. And so here's number one. Nimrod's name actually means we will rebel. It's kind of a big clue that he is not for, he is rebelling against, right? So then in verse number two, in verse nine, it says that he was a mighty man or other translations say warrior, a mighty man or warrior. And in that the Hebrew express, it really tries to help us see that means that he was a tyrannical power and violent. So we've got his name, we've got this title that was given to him, mighty man, as violent and tyrannical. Uh, but then we also have this, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And many scholars believe that this is that he hunted men, not animals. And that he did this before God's face, knowing that it was not God's plan, but he still went for it. So Nimrod was a violent warrior, a violent man, going after the people that got in the way of what he wanted. He was building a kingdom for himself and not God's kingdom. Number three, Babylon is a town that he built and Babylon is synonymous with evil. The evil systems of sin throughout the world and he was the author of that Tower of Babel, which you'll have to come back next week to hear about. And that tower was designed to elevate the power of man, not the power of God. And it was to take man and make them like God, to reach God. Number four, Nineveh, another town that he founded, which became the capital of Assyria, which conquered and dispersed Israel, not to mention the story of Jonah. Then there's the fifth one. What we see is a man who wants an empire, he wants his name to be known. He wants to gather and create in his image, not multiply and fill like he was commanded. Now, I can resonate with Nimrod, not because I want to build a tower or not because I wanna build an empire, but because sometimes I just wanna do my own thing. I wanna do it my way. Maybe you can relate. One, I'm super thankful that even though that is my disposition from time to time, my parents did not name me Nimrod. Thank you, mom and dad. But it reminds me of a, a time in my life when I was a young mom of four. I mean, a younger mom of four. <laughs> Staying at home with the weight of college debt, rent, food, diapers. And my husband was doing an incredible job caring for all of us but I still had this incredible discomfort with the fact that I was not bringing home a paycheck. 
that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing to help care for our family. I felt like that was the way to do it. I was doing what I wanted to do, not asking God what he wanted me to do. Growing up, I watched two incredible women, my grandmother and my mother. They worked full-time jobs and yet still cared for us so well. I can't think of a time when my mom was not in the, the seats when I was playing volleyball or basketball or track. She was always there. And I just thought, well, that's what I'm supposed to do too. Work and be a great mom. But as you can imagine, four kids in five years and daycare, there wasn't a job that I could get that would allow me to not be paying to go to work. So what was I to do? In one of my wrestling moments, one of my good friends said, Allison, I have an image for you. I feel like it's from the Lord. Just sit with it and see what he says. I didn't like the image. The image was that of me as a toddler, holding onto a child gate, just shaking it, trying to get out, trying to figure out what was I supposed to be doing on the other side. I didn't like this image, but I could see it. And she said, you're in a room. You're in a room with toys and books and people, albeit little people, but you are in an incredible room. What is God inviting you into? God placed me in this room. And those books were books of simple truths that he wanted me to store deep inside my heart. Those songs were to reinforce, not just for me, but for my kids, that Jesus loves me. This I know. Because the Bible, that is what tells me. There were toys all around that brought me into proximity with people that would show me a lot of things. I learned so much in this busy slowdown. Don't get me wrong, the hardest job of my life. No vacation time, no paycheck, and did I mention there's no bathroom breaks? <laughs> the pace was slow or but the pace was slow, and we had time to build and knock over towers for hours on end. I learned so much in that time. Hanging out in that room, God showed me that he wanted, me to, he wanted to invite me to sit down with him and to build, to build with those blocks, to build my character, to build our trust together, to build our understanding, and to build our compassion. I started this journey into motherhood, looking at the gate as a door preventing me from going where I thought God's plan was, when in reality, it was protecting me, creating space for me to learn the things that God had for me right here. God had a plan for me. God had a plan for our family, and we learned so much together. And honestly, every day I continue to do so. I learned so much in those moments. I got to hold my babies, and I long for those moments where I hold them in the middle of the night, even 2 a.m., mamas, and I'd get to rock them and hold them. And even though I was exhausted, I got to delight in them. And I felt God delighting in me. I also learned a lot about right and wrong and how the fact that even though my child could have done something so wrong, in that moment, there was not an ounce of a lack of love. I loved them just as much as I did before. It was just amazing to see that God loves me. God loves you that way. That even in our worst moment, he locks eyes with us and he says, I love you. I love you. I see you. I see all of it, but I love you. I'm so thankful for when God brought me that moment of that image. I hated it for months, but that image stopped me and it made me think. And that image helped me see the most rewarding opportunity I had in my entire life. It was the best calling that I'd ever been given. So moms, if I can just take a moment, even when you don't think anybody else sees you, God sees you. 
He knows you. He knows your name. He knows you need a bathroom break. But he sees you. And so whether you're at the office or you're changing diapers or you're coaching your kids from hundreds of miles away, showing them that you are still their mom and that you still see them and you love them, he sees you and he has a plan for you just the same as he has a plan for the nations. But I wanna say something to a couple of my friends. I know you want to be a mom. And I'm sorry it hasn't happened yet, but God sees you. He sees you in the yearning and he's holding you. Let him speak to you. So friends, even when we can't see it, even in those hard moments, God is working the plan. He's working the plan for you, he's working the plan for those around you, and he's working the plan for the nations. You know, Allison's story is so powerful because there are so many people who get caught in a phase of life, whether it's young mom or another phase of life, where you feel like the plan is not working the way that I put it together. And I wanna remind you, if you feel like you're stuck behind those bars and shaking them saying, God, what are you doing in my life? That God has a plan and that God is working the plan. You know, for you, you might be somebody who says, I feel like I've got too many kids, or I'm a mom too soon, or I haven't been able to have kids the way that I want to. I want you to know God is working the plan. When you look through a genealogy or ethnography chart like this, you realize God had that all figured out well in advance, what he was going to do in this world. Or maybe you're in a financial pit or a marriage crisis, or you've lost somebody dear to you. God's working the plan. Maybe you're a single person who's waiting for just that perfect spouse or learning how to be content in your singleness. I want you to know that God is working the plan. You may wonder, where is God? Where is God? I want you to know that God oftentimes does his deepest work in our darkest times. So don't be too quick to leave the dark times and the troubled moments Be quick to turn towards God so that he can craft that deep work inside of you because he has a plan. Whether you're stuck in a go-nowhere job, a mountain of diapers, or schoolwork that seems like it's never ending, God is at work and he's doing something deep inside of your life. God is working the plan. God's sovereign over history. And he's the master at putting all of his chess pieces in all the right places at all the right times. It is no mistake that you're in the job that you're in, that you're in the city that you're in, that you're in the neighborhood that you're in, that you're in the family that you're in because God has placed you there because he's got divine plans for you. And we may not discover those plans this year. It may take us a lifetime to work out. It may take generations to work out. But you can trust that in good times and bad, God is working the plan. Let's all say that together, ready? God is working the plan. He sees you, he's got you. I don't know what God has you trusting him for these days, but can I encourage you as a closing thought to reach out and trust him for anything that's troubling you. He's got a plan and we need to trust him in the midst of the difficulties of our life. He has a plan for the world, and he has a plan for your life in the middle of this world. So let's lean into him, and let's trust him in good times and bad. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand together. I'd love to pray for you. Father, we're grateful for the deep love that you have for us in Jesus. We're grateful for the life that you have given to us as well. God, we're thankful for our moms, and we're thankful for our place in history, and we're thankful for Omaha or whatever city we live in, and our neighborhood, and our jobs, and our families, and God, we know that this is not by accident, but it's by a sovereign design of you multiplying, filling the earth, and then reaching it with the good news of Jesus. Would you help us, God, to hear your voice, to understand your plan, and to lean into you in good times and in bad times? 
We look to you, grateful for the life that you've given us, and we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and our coming King, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys, and happy Mother's Day. Thank you again for engaging with us today from wherever in the world you are at. And one of our hopes is that this ministered to you in some way. And we would love to hear about that and celebrate how God is using this content. If you would send us an email online at cccomaha.org, that would be awesome to hear your story. Or if you're on YouTube, you can just drop that in the comments so we can celebrate how God is using this in your life. We'll see you soon.